First, I will give you an overview of uh, what is uh, challenging about deformables, just to introduce kind of this topic, why am I interested in it, why we're generally interested in looking into that. And then just to uh, give you a brief uh, preview of what's gonna be in the talk, I will uh, talk about the distributional uh, approach to representing the state uh, of the deformable objects. Then uh, generalizing the, the work that we're doing with deformables to incorporate uh, differentiable simulation. And then I will talk about our uh, current and future plans for uh, creating creating scalable simulation environments so that we can do large scale training. So what's difficult about deformables? Um, the biggest problem is that they have potentially an infinite number of degrees of freedom. And what does this mean here? If you are in robotics, then you are usually used to represent uh, the position orientation of a, a rigid object with, for example, six degrees of freedom, saying 3D for position and n 3D for orientation. Um, so that's one big problem because what, 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 how can we say what is the state of the deformable object? Another problem is that uh, it is pretty expensive uh, and very challenging to annotate the state of the object. Even if you were to somehow meticulously place like a lot of different markers on your object to track them, that would be pretty challenging. And so there are these uh, large uh, scanners that could help you uh, track the motion of uh, somebody who, for example, a person or a person wearing something deformable or manipulating deformables. But these uh, machines are pretty um, challenging to install and they're very expensive. So ideally we would need self-supervised or unsupervised methods so that we can just see what is happening with a deformable object, somehow learn from it without having to label things. The other uh, challenges are as follows. We uh, have occlusions when we are uh, dealing with objects for deformable and non-deformable objects, but for deformable objects, they're particularly difficult because if you look at the uh, object from different sides uh, and a, a second later, it can change shape drastically. So you can't even rely on, on trying to kind of uh, establish, you know, like look around the object and try to somehow anchor yourself to what sort of shape it has and, and maybe get sort of a sense of what the object is doing from that. The other problem is that uh, let's suppose that you try to reduce the dimensionality. So I said um, the deformable object is potentially, you know, like has infinite degrees of freedom. Um, you could uh, try to map the representation of that deformable object into a lower dimensional state. Uh, like here, for example, by tracking a few key points um, on this object. But then the problem is that even if you do this, the uh, kind of non-trivial dynamics of that deformable object will still remain. So in that lower dimensional space, you would have a few key points, but they would be jumping around like seemingly randomly and it would be very hard for you to figure out what is actually going on with the object. So we need to cope with ambiguous uh, state of, uh, of the object, potentially being able to handle occlusions and also the noisy states because if we, for example, map the, our high dimensional representation of the object into low dimensions, then for sure we would have um, uh, aggravated also the, the effects of the noise. So in the first part of the talk, I'll share with you uh, one of the approaches that we're taking, and this is to use distributional representations or rather develop distributional representations of deformables. So we can use uh, unsupervised methods to learn this, um, let, let's say, to, to map the deformable object. Let's say we just have an RGB image of this object and how it moves. And then we would be able to, using existing methods, ex extract some key points from this. But then the problem with these key points is that they would be kind of permuting and jumping randomly along uh, the length of this object. And so the representation would be pretty challenging to interpret. So what we would like to get is we would like to get a permutation invariant representation that doesn't get confused by these key points jumping uh, along the surface of the object. And we would also like to, for, for this to be uh, robust to occlusions and noise. So at first I'll show you the setup that we have on hardware when we are uh, dealing with this. So for example, here is a scenario to wind a rope. Here is a scenario to fling a highly deformable cloth into the air. And our input would be uh, these sorts of images that we just take from a regular um, RGB camera uh, that is kind of mounted uh, slightly overhead and on the side. This is a scenario to wipe a table. Uh, with a cloth that's not a very deformable cloth, but you can have a much more deformable one as well. And uh, this is a, a 3D deformable object. This is a flexible hoop or kind of a tire. And the task here is to stretch it over these two poles. So these are the scenarios that, that we're gonna be uh, looking at. And what we want to do here is we want to be uh, handling the first part of the real to sim to real. So that is real to sim. So we have a simulator here. Uh, and this is, this is actually a simulated uh, image. That's uh, just an RGB image. And uh, 
What happens here is the simulator has a cloth and it has certain parameters for this cloth, like for example, bending stiffness and elastic stiffness of this cloth, friction and scale. And what we can do is we can, uh, here we're not concerned with matching the visuals, like, like learning the match for the visuals, we will just initialize the visual representation of the object to be fairly similar to what we have in reality. But what we are interested in is we're interested in finding these parameters uh, of the simulation, so the physical parameters of the simulation, and we want to not have to search for them by hand, but we want our algorithm to be able to find them. So overall, the, uh, the overall procedure is going to be like this. We will sample a bunch of simulated trajectories. So for example, here, a bunch of different uh, sizes, different bending and, and stiffness properties for uh, this rope. And then we will extract the key points. So there are a few uh, standard methods uh, that are already out there that have been originally developed for, some of them have originally been developed for uh, rigid objects, but they can somewhat handle the deformable ones. And there are also ones that have been successfully used on the deformables before. So this is kind of existing work. And then what we will do is we will uh, create a representation from these key points that is um, not just taking the key points like in 3D or, or in 2D here in coordinate of the image, but we will embed this into a uh, high dimensional space. And I will explain this here in depth. So this, so this is the part of, of the work that, that we're presenting here. So we will interpret these key points uh, that appear along the object uh, or, or anywhere on the surface of the object as samples from the probability distribution, uh, kind of samples from the surface of the object. And so why is it a probability distribution? Because every time we run this algorithm to extract this key point, depending on the configuration of the object, we would get different kinds of key points, but they will uh, come from the surface of the deformable. And uh, then we will uh, embed these samples. So each of these we treat as, as a sample from a probability distribution. And we will embed this probability distribution uh, into an infinite dimensional space. And I'll explain how. So why are we trying to do this? This will give us the permutation and variance and robustness to noise. And this will also, so, so like why are we doing, uh, why are we dealing with this infinite dimensional spaces? Because this lets us get a convenient distance metrics between these distributions, between the distributional embeddings. And this way we will be able to say whether one bunch of points basically uh, is similar to another bunch of points in a way that basically relates the two distributions as opposed to just like looking directly at the points. So now I'll just introduce the background for what, what does this mean embedding uh, mean. Uh, so it's a, um, a map uh, f that uh, maps the distribution into an infinite dimensional space here. So here I'm just drawing a cartoon version of a distribution, okay, and, and, and it's mapped into some embedded space. And um, the reason why it's interesting is because it can represent, so this kind of mapping can represent uh, the probability distributions in a non, um, in a in non parametric way and without loss of information. And here, uh, I've, I've given some background here, what does it mean without loss of information? That means that uh, this mapping can recover uh, all of the uh, kind of functions uh, within this space uh, into which we're mapping. That's called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Uh, but within that space, there is a dot product, meaning that we can measure distances between this distribution and something else. So for example, other distributions or other functions that appear in the space. And via this dot product, if we uh, complete this mapping, then via this dot product, we will be able to measure distances. And so what this would give us is this would give us a very nice representation presentation for how to basically say how similar the two distributions are uh, after the embedding. So now how are we going to do this in practice? Uh, in practice, we're not going to have access to the actual probability distribution, right? We're only going to have samples. So these samples are going to be this x1 through xn endpoints that we just get every time we look at a frame um, and we see a deformable object there and we extract the key points. And the empirical part of it is that we're going to be taking these samples and uh, extracting uh, infinite dimensional features from them and summing them all up. And this will constitute our embedding. So this is kind of a known object and I'm just uh, outlining here how we're going to practically do it in this case. But one more step that we need to do to make it actually uh, computable is this phi here is kind of an abstract object. We're like taking our point and we map into some infinite dimensional space. How would we do it? Um, 
And so here we're going to use the line of work that has been uh, around for some time since uh, 2007 that is called uh, random Fourier features. And in summary, what this does is it lets us use an approximate mapping phi hat in order to be able to extract kind of like a finite dimensional vector uh, from this and still be able to retain some of the properties that, that we wanted to uh, have originally. All right, and so here I will describe what this mapping is, and, and this part is previous work, so this can be found uh, in this paper that I've cited here. So after uh, going through the math of uh, how we can do this approximation, what will come out of this math is that we will have basically a bunch of sines and cosines in a vector, and how many sines and cosines we would have would dictate how approximate our representation is. So each uh, sine and cosine vector here would basically be kind of like picking a coordinate um, and then using that coordinate and uh, basically having a few parameters where we uh, decide kind of how to map our, uh, um, in, uh, our uh, point x here onto that coordinate. And then we would basically pick a bunch of these coordinates, but you have to uh, kind of use an abstract uh, reasoning here. So like these coordinates are actually functions. So we're kind of mapping onto the space, in the space of functions, and each coordinate is a function. And if you remember your sines and cosines, they're kind of some, somehow orthogonal uh, in this space. And so this is why we can construct ourselves a very nice um, kind of uh, coordinates onto which we're gonna be mapping this, but we don't have to use all of the coordinates, like there's an infinite number of them. And so the interesting part here is that we will be able to adaptively pick out which ones of these we're gonna end up using and also how many of them we will be using will dictate how approximate our representation would be. So uh, for those of you who know something about kernel methods, maybe you've heard or, or you've dealt with them in some other context, the reason why we are also interested in, in this kind of setup is because uh, one can show that if we draw these uh, vectors here randomly from some distribution, like for example from standard normal, uh, then we can approximate uh, a radial basis uh, function kernel. And so this is just a remark for those of you who, who know about the kernels and if those people who kind of do research in, in, in the space of kernels, they have various intuitions about what is good. They can sample from different distributions to approximate different kernels. And so overall, this just nicely connects to the kernel methods in general. So I will stop here for a little bit um, because I have basically summarized kind of what our representation is and I will let you ask questions. And then um, the last thing I'll say here is that what we are going to try to do here is we're going to try to uh, um, adjust the parameters that uh, basically pick out which uh, random vectors we use and how we stretch these random vectors, um, we're going to adjust them via backpropagation. So the reason why I call this an RKHS net layer is because we're going to put this transformation here is in a differentiable way into our networks and then whatever other algorithms we're gonna be using, we're going to be able to adaptively adjust these parameters. All right, so I'll pause here and let people ask questions. If things are, no questions. Zoom people, there's your chance. Jeanette is gonna ask a question. Oh, oh gonna be no, I was, I was gonna ask, does anyone have a question on this? Um, anything on the kernel methods, on the features? Uh, anyone? I did have one quick question, which is, I just wanted to better understand this, the dot product or like how, how it shows up numerically. Also, hi, this is Shreyas. Oh, hi, uh, Dot product numerically. Yes. Yes. So uh, what this says is that uh, we will have a space where the dot product would make sense. And so basically, if we, um, th th this is just like a theory part, right? If we uh, had some function f, uh, with this embedded representation, we would be able to compute the expectation of that function f via the dot product. This relates to just like regular kernel methods. And the reason why this is interesting is because dot product is related to norms, is related to basically similarities or distances between the points in the space. And so here, maybe uh, uh, some function f, okay, what could this function be? I don't know. But in this particular case, we could be be interested in something like an embedding of one uh, distribution and embedding of another distribution. And then what we can see is we can see, okay, for these two distributions, uh, how, how close are they in the sense of how similar uh, these two states of the objects are? 
And so it's basically it's a state representation of the object where after the embedding, you can say that uh, because you have a continuous mapping that is nicely behaved, because you have a mapping where the distances, like in embedded space, the distances matter, then you can compare how different the two distributions are. And so that means that you can compare the two states. And yeah, that's, that's the usefulness of it. Does that answer your question? I assume yes. There was another <laughs> question. I have a question on the on the key points. Is this could you replace the key points with um, a binary mask on the image, like distinguishing between the background and, and the object, and using those the, the pixels instead of the? Key you points? could. The only problem is how would you get that mask? Yeah, exactly. So we will actually be using the mask as a ground truth to do the evaluation, but we will not let any algorithms see that because, I mean, you have to hand construct this somehow. The key points, you don't have to do anything in the case of using unsupervised methods. You throw a bunch of data at the unsupervised method, it learns how to extract these key points. So that's the benefit of it. Yeah. Any other questions? I think. Um, yeah, I kind of have two. So the first one is uh, the key points themselves you're assuming are like drawn from some random distribution, right? Some probabilistic distribution and that they're uncorrelated, right? Uh, yeah, let me explain. So the key points, the one assumption that we make is that they uh, are points on the surface of a deformable object. So they're not drawn from any analytic probability distribution. They're just uh, whatever method you use to extract them, it says, oh, okay, here is the object moving. I'm going to place some key points along this object. And um, the, the second question was? Uh, well, just to follow up on that, is the key point detector, does it account for like temporal dependence? No. Okay. Uh, it does not, right, and that's exactly what we want here. So we want our uh, key point extractor to be free to place them anywhere. And if they permute, for example, so if in one frame I have a bunch of key points and then one of these key points just moves somewhere else on the object, uh, that's perfectly fine. That's the permutation invariance that we want to have in our representation. So the one thing that we do not do here is we do not do key point tracking through time, right. like over frames. That's where I'm going with this. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, the reasoning for that is that if you can do it great, that can help you wonderfully with rigid objects. With the formables, you frequently either can't or it is very, very difficult. You need a lot of data to somehow establish this correspondence. And so that's why we would want to have something which does not need, like from, from very little data, it can uh, have a representation where you are okay with the key points permuting and you can still meaningfully do something with that representation. Right, plus you could have a bad initialization if you were you could, yes. So yeah. what, what's the point of, so once you embed the, the features, are you like going to decode them into these parameters? Is that where you're going with this? We are gonna go with this, yes, okay. next, right. So we're not going to directly to decode them, but what we're going to use, yeah, I'm gonna be answering your question over the next five slides, okay. yes. Um, so what can we do with this, right? So, so we get this representation, we plug it into some neural network that is gonna learn something useful for us. Uh, here what we're doing is we're doing real to sin, so we're trying to get some sort of a real data and figure out which simulation parameters are most likely kind of uh, to generate this data. And we're going to plug this into a method that is called BaseSim, this was at RSS 2019, and uh, a version of this method, what it does is it trains a mixture density network to take input trajectories and output a Gaussian mixture distribution over the simulation parameters. So the, here the simulation parameters were uh, bending and elastic stiffness, uh, friction, and scale. Uh, and you know, you can have arbitrary parameters here, whatever it is that your simulator can vary. The training objective for this would be just data log likelihood. And so the way that we would train this initially is we would take simulator trajectories, and you can generate a bunch of them, train this network, um, and then you would basically have a mapping from the input trajectory to the uh, probability distribution over the simulation parameters. And here, what I will be showing uh, as results is comparison of uh, when you take as input just the trajectories, meaning just the key points, versus when you pass them through this RKHS net layer that does this distributional uh, representation, and then you pass this through this network. So ultimately, uh, to answer Chris's question, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be training this intermediate thing here that will then help us to infer the distributions over simulation parameters, and that is our real-to-sim problem.
So after this network is trained, we're going to give a real trajectory um, to, uh, as input, and we're going to infer the uh, distribution of our simulation parameters that is most likely um, for, kind of, for this kind of trajectory. And then what we can do after this is we can actually repeat all of this over and over in order to make these distributions more peaked. So we can collect the next uh, batch of simulation, simulated data kind of more narrowly around the regions which are more likely, then again, uh, retrain uh, the um, base sim mixture density network, then uh, get another trajectory from hardware or use the same trajectory and obtain more peak posteriors. So this is what we're going to be doing with it. Now, uh, to show you what this comes up with is uh, here an example for the results with the winding scenario where we extract the key points. We, we mask out the robot here because we know the state of the robot. We know its shape, we know where it is, so we don't really worry about what the robot is doing, but we don't know anything about the deformable. So we just have an RGB image of this. And here, uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna be first using unsupervised key points. And to evaluate here, we're gonna measure the distance to the ground true state, and uh, this is what Somebody else was asking, uh, can you get a mask? So here, just for evaluation purposes, we would say, uh, okay, just based on the uh, colors here, uh, make a mask for where the deformable is and compare how well did you, uh, how well is your um, simulation that is sampled with the parameters from the result, uh, how well does it align with the actual real um, image? And uh, what I'm showing here as results is, comparison for this base sim method using the um, inputs just as is, so just key points, or using another way of just using random uh, Fourier features without the, the distributional embedding. And so these are these two lines. And then these two lines are using the uh, distributional embedding as I described before, uh, with just uh, slightly different ways of, of learning the mixture density network. So. Um, that's the result for unsupervised key points. You can also use supervised methods that have been specifically developed for handling deformables. And here you can see uh, for, for this kind of object, they are pretty noisy. So that's, that's gonna be difficult for um, the method to handle if you don't have this distributional embedding. But if you do have the distributional embedding, then again, you can reduce the distance to the ground truth quite a bit. Um, we also compare to batch methods here uh, on the side where, or, or I say bulk here, where we just, uh, for all of the data that these algorithms would ultimately see, we just collect this data ahead of time, we don't do anything iterative, and we just batch train either a simple neural network or a simple uh, Gaussian process, and then see how well we can recover the, uh, param the simulation parameters. So similarly, uh, we can go to the other scenarios. Uh, these are unsupervised key points for uh, the fling task, and these are supervised ones. So you can see the supervised ones, they can be very nicely placed kind of uh, almost on the corners of the cloth. So that could be nice. But the problem is that if they permute, then you kind of have an even noisier uh, result because you have managed to rely on this representation being somehow coherent, and then with the noise, it uh, tricks you and, and you can potentially have difficulties. So, which is shown here with this uh, yellow and green line. And then in the uh, case where we're using the uh, mean embedding, again, we can reduce the distance to the ground truth uh, quite a bit better. And so this is the result with the supervised key points. And similarly, uh, with the wiping task, uh, here we have this uh, problem where the robot mask didn't work out so well for the uns um, unsupervised key points, but we can, we're still able to get a reasonably good result even with um, this kind of problem. And for the supervised key point uh, case, these are kind of nearly perfect, always placed on the corners, very nice. And so you can see that the baseline algorithms here, they're doing a little bit better, but still, again, the key points can sometimes permute, and that's why they can be a bit confusing still. And this is our last example with the deformable uh, hoop or a tire. Again, you can see here that the key points can be noisy, not only permuting in different places of the object, but also kind of being kind of leftover extraneous noise. And that can still be, um, can still be okay for um, the algorithms that are using this mean embedding. All right, and this is with the supervised key points, which is the few key points placed on the hoop. Okay, so 
What we have here is an ability to get an inference over the probability distribution of simulation parameters that would make the simulation behave most like reality. Um, we can do this from just a single real trajectory, or potentially we can go on and continue to get uh, new uh, trajectories. And even if there's something that is changing in our scenario or in the dynamics of the objects, um, this can still uh, kind of function in such a way that we can shift our posteriors and we can obtain newer and newer results. And so this can dynamically let us kind of adapt our uh, resulting simulation to something that we see in reality. So uh, for this part, uh, we're good. If people have more questions, I can answer them, but I think we had quite a few before. So now I'm going to give just a brief snapshot of uh, our uh, current work. And this work is to uh, generalize this a bit. So previously what we had is we had a, what we call black box simulator, where we can't pass the gradients through that simulator. Just, you know, we can create some, you know, um, simulation parameters, run the simulation, and get some sort of an output. And here we are using a, dif a differentiable simulator, and we are also able to work with point clouds. So instead of just being able to, like, see the image um, and just do something with that RGB image, here we're going to be taking a look at, uh, at whether whether we can use uh, the point cloud of the object. So this is work that is done with a PhD student who was rotating in our group, Priya uh, Sundaresan. And uh, here I will just go very briefly over the setup. So I won't go too much in depth, but just to give you an idea of, of uh, how this can be done. So um, our input is point cloud uh, that is obtained from these two cameras, one overhead and one on the side. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is, okay, our objective here again is to infer the simulation parameters. So that's going to be kind of like our output in a sense, like the, the desired question that we want to answer. And what we'll do is first we will run this physics engine in order to simulate the deformable. So for example, this piece of cloth here that we're lifting up. And then we'll get the mesh states of this deformable. But then the key part here is that we need to uh, basically plug this into a differentiable rendering framework where we can connect the, um, not the mesh states, but the points uh, sampled from, these, uh, from this mesh to be able to compare that with the real point cloud. And then if we do this in a differentiable manner, then what we can do is we can pass back the gradients all the way through the mesh states, through the um, dynamics of the uh, simulator here, to ad adjust the simulation parameters, which here is the stiffness and mass, for example. And then we keep on going, uh, do this a few times. And so here, um, let's see, this is going to be playing. Right, uh, I'm going to show uh, what Priya has done in her experiments with the real cloth and real point clouds, being able to infer the, um, uh, the, the kind of stiffness of the cloth here that the cloth is not collapsing when you lift it up in one case. Like this is actually a paper towel, so it's like a pretty stiff one. And this is a, a very heavy and collapsible cloth, and we're able to uh, figure this out and adjust the simulator, uh, simulation parameters accordingly. Um, why would we want to do this? So uh, one reason is that if we use other approaches which use uh, non-differentiable simulators, then what we would need to do first is collect some simulated data, so that would take some time, train some networks, that would take some time. And so here we compare with a few of the baseline methods in terms of how much time it takes to collect the data and train it. But with what we call diff cloud, so this approach, this uses the differentiable simulator and passes back the gradients all the way from the point cloud directly, in 10 minutes, we can be done uh, as opposed to uh, a few hours. And so this is the benefit of doing this. So that basically, we can get speed. And hopefully, we can also get uh, better uh, accuracy in some cases. So this blue, uh, these blue bars here is the uh, result with the diff cloud. And then the other baseline methods um, on some of the uh, scenarios that we have, um, they have a little bit of uh, higher loss. So. Um, Right, and so these are just a few more scenarios that we're working on right now, where uh, we have tested things in sim to sim kind of preliminary experiments, and we're continuing to do this to get to the uh, real to sim. Right, uh, if anybody has questions on the differentiable simulation part, I can answer. Zoom people, yes. Uh, I guess, like, what was the um, the reason behind like moving to a point cloud, point cloud representation over like something different? Great. Yes. So um, previously, uh, those pictures that I showed was the you know the, the simulation looked like close to reality, right? You need to kind of do this by hand, 
right? So you need to, um, I don't know, take a picture of your object and import the texture of that object into the simulator, right? So okay, that takes me a few minutes, but if I wanted to do it fully autonomously, how would I do it? So one motivation there would be to use differentiable rendering, which renders the RGB images for you. But the problem that is when you try to do, okay, real to sim, then you would need to match the actual textures of the objects. And if you have a cloth that is similar but happens to have a different texture, okay, now you have to redo that. So the one motivation here is that, okay, um, doing this in, in a fully differentiable manner, that's great, I can do everything automatically, but dealing with point clouds is more general because now I don't need to worry about the colors, the textures of the object. And um, that is actually what we're hoping to kind of test in, in, in the upcoming work that we have is can we do sim to real and then not be bothered by, you know, different textures, not have to like find contrasting colors and objects and so on. Yes. Yeah. Um, explain why do we need to um, extract the point clouds from the mesh? And oh, do, um, um, yes. Compare the mesh to yes, the yes, yes, yes. So uh, this part here, the physics engine and, and getting the mesh states, that's differentiable, right? But this is where the physics engine ends, right? So if I have as an input a point cloud, it is not connected in any way to these mesh states. So I wouldn't know, let's say this point cloud here is a little bit to the right, this mesh states are somehow a little more crumbled, I wouldn't know how to pass gradients between them. So that's why I, we need a sampling method, but the sampling method needs to be differentiable. And so then we sample, then you can have a loss on this part, that is, is the sampled point cloud and the real point cloud, that is just a simple loss like chamfer loss, for example, we're just comparing two point clouds, that's differentiable, but then in order to be able to propagate back, you need to have this procedure be differentiable. Yeah. All right. So, um, ultimately, what I would like to also get to is ability to um, have um, not only roboticists, but uh, contributions from uh, various parts of, let's say, machine learning community, computer vision community, other communities that could uh, have insights into how to represent deformables, how to have a meaningful, interesting state for deformables, and how to train various policies with deformables. So because I think that um, it would be uh, kind of, uh, the community effort like this would, would let us train uh, faster and be able to uh, kind of uh, perform more advanced tasks, um, I think it's important to create the environments that other people in the community can use uh, very easily. Uh, so for example, this is uh, a work with my previous group when um, uh, at KTH, where we have created um, uh, uh, dynamic environments with deformable objects. That's a suite of environments that uh, has an OpenAI GIM interface. So you know you can uh, run your favorite RL algorithm on this plug and play. Uh, you, it's, it has fast runtime. It has nice visualizations in TensorBoard, and it's pretty easy to customize. So if you wanted to create kind of new environments that iterate on these environments that we already have, then uh, you can kind of introduce new materials into this. You can load custom meshes and textures. And we gave an example with like a very uh, lo loading a very a large um, number of different meshes, uh, object meshes here. Right, so this is what this looks like. Uh, so it's not photorealistic, but okay, this is entertaining enough uh, for uh, different learning algorithms that, for example, computer vision people can uh, work with this. And it has deformables with uh, a few simple scenarios, like for example, hanging um, some sort of um, a clothing item on, onto a hanger here. And we've given examples of how to, uh, um, import existing very large, like 20 to 1,000 uh, size data set of different garments with, with different uh, kinds of um, clothing items into this. Uh, we also have uh, basic ways of generating, procedurally generating meshes. And so that, that's also interesting because you can train your algorithms and test their generalization on some objects that it has never seen before. Um, and also a few tasks that are kind of multi-stage tasks where it would be pretty difficult for uh, just like a generic model-free RL algorithm to uh, complete a task like this. 
And so uh, where we're going with this is that we want to be able to, let's say, incorporate reinforcement learning algorithms uh, into our, our robotic setup where a robot does something. But first, we want to test, can these algorithms actually do something useful on these kinds of objects? And after pretty extensive hyperparameter search, we I could see that, for example, state-of-the-art PPO version uh, was able to very quickly bring up this apron to the um, hanger here, but it wasn't able to hang it. And we actually observed that in most of the scenarios that we've composed, so for example, this bag, very easily, like within very few um, uh, episodes, uh, the algorithm would be able to bring it up to the hook, but not able to hang it. Or it will be able to pull it towards the other pole, but would not able to kind of lift up this hoop here and transfer it to another pole, and so on and so forth. So what we would like to do is we would like to give it out to community and let them figure out how to tune or create new algorithms that are able to work with this kind of data. And of course, for the robotics part, what we ultimately want to do is we want to do some advanced scenarios that are in um, for example, dual arm manipulation or something with um, an, a robot doing something like, for example, here, a food packing task where you have some deformable objects in, in the form of a fruit and some non-deformable objects. So these are the scenarios um, that we've um, uh, put uh, and made it available to the community last year already. And what we're working on right now in uh, collaboration with uh, Meta, or formerly Facebook, and a few of the master students um, that have joined this project is uh, putting the deformables into the framework that is called AI Habitat. So this framework uh, was uh, created by um, Meta. And uh, their original motivation was to create uh, interesting, visually interesting environments where you can do mobile navigation uh, and mobile manipulation. But of course, the deformables, uh, even if they were present there in some form, they were just like fake objects there. Where they, they did not have the deformable physics associated with them. So our task is to be able to kind of create uh, some of the setups here that would be interesting for uh, deformables, for example, sp spreading the tablecloth on the table, or wiping the table, or hanging something on the hanger. Uh, but now in this much more advanced uh, environment where you're actually like in an apartment-like uh, setup as opposed to just like one pole and one item to hang. All right, so that's our, let's see, yeah, so, so the AI Habitat is, is our current ongoing work. And overall, um, what are the next steps for the things that I have presented so far? So one thing uh, that we want to do is we would like to extend this uh, RKHS net um, approach from just looking at the deformables to looking at generally partially observable settings. Can we uh, uh, extract uh, interesting representations and um, get some improvements uh, in, in those uh, cases. And for the differentiable simulators, we would still like to expand the kind of scenarios that we were able to deal with because differentiable simulators, they're usually a little bit more constrained in terms of what kind of setups you can have there. So they're not as advanced as the lots of the black box simulators that we've had from before. Um, so that's a little bit of a challenge, but yeah, we would like to do this. And um, the other thing, of course, that you can do with differentiable simulators is you can also differentially adjust the policy parameters. So instead of doing reinforcement learning where you assume that everything is black box, you can uh, propagate back and do not only real to sim, but uh, the just policy learning in general. And so after that, we hopefully will be ready to do the sim to real and the sim to real part would uh, draw heavily on this work with AI Habitat where we would try to basically train the algorithm over you know, many different variations of the environment um, in such a way that it's general enough so that it can just be transferred to um, hardware. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Rika. Sure. More questions. Questions. Yes. I would like questions. Yes. yes. Okay. I have one about the RKHS net. Yes. Um, Let's go. So are there like, are there works that take this posterior distribution over parameters and use them for some downstream application? Uh, like the benefit of, right. of knowing them would be for some sort of like control application, right? Or some, yes. some planning application. Yes, exactly. So um, in this whole framework was BaseSim. Uh, usually what we would do with base sim is we would, um, oh, I wish I had a slide. <laughs> I have lots of slides with this framework where on the side you would have a reinforcement learning algorithm basically training on 
the posterior for this simulation parameters. So let me explain a little bit uh, more in depth. So what happens after one iteration of this is you have these sorts of things where, where these distributions, uh, they're not about the distribution of embedding that I've talked about, right? These distributions are the distributions over the simulation parameters, right? Okay, so what you can do with that is you sample a bunch of uh, simulation uh, parameters there, and then these become your environments on which you train your current um, learner, like your reinforcement learning algorithm, right? Then what you do after this is you go back and you say, okay, great, I've trained now. Um, I, you can either... Uh, um, yeah, sorry, so you, you go back here and you say, okay, now that I've trained my uh, updated policy in simulation, how well does it perform in hardware? So I run the hardware rollout again, right? Uh, I infer uh, my uh, posterior and then again, I can resample and retrain because now running this on hardware has given me uh, kind of new and updated information as to what the simulation parameters should actually be. And so you can go on and on and on like this. And ultimately, this BASIM algorithm is designed as an iterative algorithm and precisely to, uh, inter to have the interplay with RL. Um, but the key here is that depending on the representation of the state that you have here, you would be more or less successful inferring these parameters. And that would, of course, cause you to be more or less successful in training your RL policy. So that's what, I mean, it's a little bit, um, it's a lot of stuff all packaged at once, right? But that is kind of the full circle for you. You start with a simulation which does not align with reality. You figure out how to align it with reality, but in the process on the side, you also train the policy. And so at the end of it, you get not only the aligned simulation, but also the policy that can act in, in the reality. Yeah. So I would think something like this would be useful even in the second work, right? Because I, I'm not too sure about differential yes. simulation, but I assume that the physics engine itself like has some sort of approximations, right? Yes. That would lead to some steady state error. That's right. And after you do gradient descent to get your parameters. So wouldn't it be still good to have like a probabilistic estimate even in that case? It could be. The difference here is that um, in this case, what you can do is you can compare directly with the real here. So um, let's see if I can explain this. Mm, basically, you can do this multiple times here, right? So you will get into the local optimum right away, right? But uh, you will have some sort of a policy in that local optimum. So then you can roll out, uh, run a, uh, roll out that policy and get yourself like another real, a bunch of real observations, and again compare and again back prop. Now this is in theory, right? In reality, you would get into a local optimum, which is not very useful, and then you would need to be innovative in order to do something. And I think you're exactly right. It is actually. Pretty difficult to do this jointly when you're trying to learn the parameters of the simulator and the policy. And we have loads and loads in this particular area. There are loads and loads of, of uh, examples where this is kind of too unidentifiable. It is very difficult to do this jointly. So you might opt out to say something like, OK, great, we have shown this works really, really well for real to sim. We'll, we do real to sim. And then we do policy learning in some other way. Like, for example, as you're saying, using this other framework or using any other framework. Right. Um, we would still like to try doing it either jointly or interleaving, yeah, but it could be the case that this is a bit too hard. Yeah. Thank you, Rita. More questions? Also from people who are on Zoom? You're also welcome to ask questions. Yes, please ask questions. Nobody asks questions. I will start asking you questions. <laughs> I, ha I have an oddball question. Cool. Um, and, and maybe this is a fundamental misunderstanding. So you're, you're computing this distribution over parameters that specify the behavior of, let's say, a mesh or some, some representation of a deformable object, correct? Yes. OK, is there, I mean, could the parameters be just like points on the mesh? Or is there a way to actually just directly just represent the deformable object as, like in an RKHS, as some sort of level set of a function or something? Right. So I think here um, the problem is that we don't actually fully know where the deformable object is, right? So, I mean, hopefully this is not too dark here, but uh, there is something moving there, right? And um, we think that the deformable object is in that area. So we need some way to represent that object. 
Okay, one way to represent this object is to, I don't know, cut out a piece of the RGB, I don't know, uh, image here and just use that. But it's probably gonna get some background or something else in it, right? So basically we first of all need some way to uh, figure out, okay, what representation we're going to be using for this object. And that's precisely what this thing is about. It is saying, well, what we could do is we could place a bunch of key points on this object, but instead of doing it manually, right, there are algorithms that would let us do it automatically. And then instead of using these key points directly, because I've shown how this doesn't really succeed um, with um, just using these key points directly, what we can do is we can embed these key points and that creates for us a much nicer representation that's permutation invariant and smooth. So basically it's a way to represent the state of the deformable object and what this goes back to I think is to the very beginning is here, right? So here I'm saying, okay, what is the state of this object? Well, okay, it has a bunch of, I mean, it's not even a mesh because when I have a real object, I don't really have like a known mesh associated with this object. So just so something that is moving, right? Either I have kind of depth uh, point clouds or I have an RGB image of it. So that's basically the whole point. It is one version of a representation for an object that potentially has an infinite degrees of freedom and otherwise I wouldn't know how to represent it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that, that, makes, that makes sense and clarifies. Uh, so would this then work? I feel like this would also work for things like representing food or like I think the classical question is like the state space of an onion, right? Yes, nice. <laughs> representing food, you said? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess uh, what would be, how would you really like push this yes. beyond just deformable objects? Um, okay, maybe I need to make this clear. So I have tried to pick the most deformable object. So like food is less deformable than this, right? Uh, I think but, it means uh, like onions being chopped. Going oh, from you mean yeah. something that is like um, part partitions objects, so like particles, it like goes fluid. From a yeah, exactly. to a... yeah, 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 yeah. So one thing that I don't really know yet how I would handle it in this framework is something like fluids or smoke, because there is no surface, right? Um, something that is an onion, you could imagine that if you don't chop it into like, you know, dust, but you actually have pieces of onion, right? Then you can keep track of, of these uh, pieces that end up being there. You can extract the key points and place them there. So you can do this. Um, where food becomes uh, particles, so like porridge or you're pouring something, that I am not sure because then the surface of the object is kind of like everywhere in space. And so that, that, that I would have to experiment with and see what happens there. But for things that are uh, springy or like that, that are compressible uh, but still are in a few pieces, that thing, yeah, that, that thing could work for it. Very cool. Thank you. Ultimately, another thing that I would like to do is experiment a little bit more with what happens with occlusions. So we had we had occlusions in, in the scenarios that we have, but we haven't kind of stress tested it, like what happens if the object is fully or like, you know, almost fully occluded and then re-emerges in something like this. Um, so that would be interesting, would be interesting to see what happens then.